So just to, to make sure that we are up to date, last time we saw that the random walks on a graph that we have been considering actually are just special cases of Markov chains, right? In fact, that is the very reason why at some point Breen and Page decided to look at the page rank as a random walk on a graph. Because in that case, you can leverage techniques that are known for, and actually results that are known for Markov chains hmm, to come up with an algorithm, a ranking algorithm, that does not suffer from many of the problems we have seen. And we have seen that mo the main two problems are the following. The web graph is a directed graph. <coughs> hmm? It may not be strongly connected. Clear? Not strongly connected? You should know that. Second year. Okay? Strongly connected directed <coughs> graph. So, if it is strongly connected for every pair of vertices, there is a, a directed path from one to the other, and vice versa. In that case, the corresponding Markov chain is called irreducible. Another problem, so it, it means that, for example, you want to remove edges like, uh, vertices like this. I mean, this is horrible. This is a dead end. I mean, the, there is no outgoing link. It means that, that in the adjacency matrix or transition matrix associated to this, to this graph, <coughs> you have a row of zeros or a column of zeros, depending on the matrix you consider, for every node like this one. Is it clear? Hmm? So it is not even a Markov chain. How do we remove this? That's simple. You just, you just add <coughs> n outgoing links for every such node. In this case, you'll get something like this or like this, okay? A row with the same um, entry or a column. Um, okay, so it seems that we are okay. Well, not quite. We still need to fix issues like this, or more general one, in which you start, hmm, you see, you jump. And if you have a situation like this, there is no way you are going to assign a unique score to your nodes because uh, the score you assign is going to change from one iteration to the next. Actually, this is a very simple case that you immediately recognize, but there can be more subtle ones. Hmm? I mean, it just... This is just a slightly more subtle one, okay? For depending on where you start, each of these nodes will only have a probability of being visited, which is non-zero in multiple of three time steps, right? And you can have way more complicated situations. And also you know that finding a cycle in a graph is somewhat boring, right? Finding the cycles that exist in a graph well, may not be a nice uh, endeavor. Not something you want to do anyway. And anyway, if, even if you find them, then what? So how do we fix this, all these problems at once? Now, in the following, I am assuming, in the following, I am assuming that we have removed any dead ends, okay? We have removed the dead ends, all of them, just by adding and links, including a self-loop. Even if we do this, the graph may still be correspond to an irreducible, to a reducible Markov chain. I mean, it can be. Okay, could be. Could it be? Uh, I'm not, no longer so sure. Maybe not. But still, the graph, uh, you could still have periodic states, okay? So a periodic state, as I was telling you, is one state such that the following, uh, did I ever tell you about periodic states in the past lecture? Yes, did I? Okay, so then I do not have to repeat myself. Anyway, periodic state.
Okay. So, in a if a state is periodic, it means that there is some integer delta such that you can only visit it at multiple of, uh, of delta time steps. Hmm? Whenever a Markov chain has even a single state like this, the Markov chain is said periodic. With periodic Markov chains, uh, in general, what happens is the following. How did we call the distribution at time t? P of t? Was it P of t? The distribution of the states at time t. If the chain is periodic, this limit is not defined in general. You, have, you can have multiple stationary distributions, okay? Um, well, stationary not, actually. They're not even stationary. Otherwise, you have non-stationary distribution. The distribution oscillates between one or more distributions. How do we remove this? Teleports. Eh? It is not. You adopt uh, a Star Trek solution. Okay? So, a Star Trek solution means that from every state you're in, you have a non zero probability of being able to reach any other node or web page if you want in the graph. Okay? That is called teleporting. And teleporting is going to solve all of our problems. Uh, first of all, why would teleporting solve all of our problems? Let us look at this example. Let's assume now that we simply modify the network like this. Um. Well, in this case, we made a complete graph. It is clear that the chain is no longer periodic, right? I mean, I can go anywhere else. Um, it is not exactly what we want, because if you have a complete network, the stationary distribution is always the uniform distribution. So, page rank will assign the same score to every node in the network, so it's useless. But we can do something a bit more sophisticated than this. Mm. First of all, uh, did you check, did you have uh, any time to check uh, the notes I put on the website? Because in that case, you know that if the, if the Markov chain is irreducible, so the underlying graph is strongly connected and it is aperiodic, so you have no periodic states, then if you apply the power method, the power method is going to converge to one single stationary distribution. Ah, which is beautiful. So what does it mean? Let me write it in transpose form, okay? This is the transition matrix of the Markov chain, hmm? or of your random walk. So this limit exists, and it, is, it has the form of one particular stationary distribution. Now, this distribution does not depend on time. Okay, it's a vector of numbers that sum to one. It's a probability distribution. Also, since it is a stationary distribution, it has the following nice property. Once you're there, you stay there forever. Um, also, it is unique. It is the only one 
for which this is true. There is not a second one for this, this is true. It's the only stationary distribution that you can have. What happens if the Markov chain, for example, is not is reducible but not periodic? It can happen. Actually, whenever that is the case, you will have, for example, if you have two uh, irreducibility classes, you will have two such distributions. We can come back to this. Hmm? Let's say irreducibility is not really the most terrible issue. The most terrible issue is existence of dead ends that you have to remove, otherwise it is not a Markov chain, and periodic states, because you have no limit in the stationary distribution. Instead, if the Markov chain is just, is just reducible, but not periodic, you will have more than one stationary distribution, that's all. And this distribution will depend on where your random walk begins. Okay, that's all. Um, now, so once we have this, we have this. Notice the very good things that we have at the same time. Actually, first of all, we can compute this using the power method, starting from one stationary one distribution. Also, there are two interesting facts. First of all, if you look at this equation, right? Uh, actually, at this limit. So this is a distribution that does not depend on this vector. Okay, for example, uh, do you remember what a canonical vector is? Canonical? Yes? Let me ask, uh, very simple. Let us define the ith canonical vector, for example. It's a vector which has only a one in the ith position, okay? It is a probability distribution, right? It means uh, if, for example, if this is true, it means that you are starting from the ith vertex. You, you are starting your random walk from the ith vertex, okay? What this result is telling us, that no matter where you are starting from, you will always end up in the same stationary distribution which is a very interesting and remarkable fact. Uh, of course, this can be itself a more complicated distribution, right? It's only important that this component sum to one. But no matter what this vector looks like, as long as it is a probability distribution, the power method will converge to the same solution. Ah, that's the beauty of ergodic Markov chain, so irreducible and aperiodic Markov chains. They exhibit this very, very nice property. Um, a consequence of this fact is that at this point, if you are able to define a random walk on your graph or a modified version of your graph that corresponds to uh, an ergodic Markov chain, you have a way of giving every node the score, a number, hmm, that is always the same. It does not depend on where you start from and all the scores that you give to the nodes are non-negative, hmm? actually they're positive if the Markov mark chain is irreducible. Hmm? They will be maybe very small, but never zero. <coughs> and so in, you have a way to essentially score your vertices, okay? Now there is another issue also, another thing that allows us to better understand why this would be a good idea. There is another result that is true, which is the following. Mm. If the matrix is ergodic, hmm? if the random walk is ergodic, okay? So, 
what is this? What does this mean? Do you know what this means? Hmm? Non ho capito. Well, I see that. But I, it's a limit. It's the limit of a sum, actually. It's not a series, it's a limit of a sum. I mean, you can define the series in it, but... Um, no, let me show you something. Mm, I have to define the symbol. That's... Okay, so let us, uh, you remember what this variable was. This is the state in which the Markov chain is at time t. So, this is a binary variable, and it has value 1 if the random walk is in state i at time t, otherwise it is 0. So if I want to know how many times was the chain in, uh, um, how many times was the chain in uh, state i, from time 0 to time 8, to time t, sorry. Hmm? Let's call this number ni of t. So the number of times that the random walk was in state i from time 0 to time t. What should I do? This is trivially equal. Right? You see that? What is the expectation of this number? Do you know the rest? The expectation of this is the expectation of this, right? But you know, when you have the sum of expectation of expectations, it's always equal to the, uh, sorry, when you have the expectation of the sum, it's always equal, always, equal to the sum of the expectations. So I can write this. How much is the expectation of this variable? Hmm? Come on, the expectation of a Bernoulli variable. This is a Bernoulli variable, right? This one. How much is the expectation of a Bernoulli variable? Hey, no, no, that's a uniform distribution. It's a Bernoulli variable. Let's say you have a Bernoulli variable with parameter p. What is the probability, what is the expectation of the variable? p. Is this correct? Yeah? How much is this? How much is this probability? Notice, when you're dealing with probabilities and, and variables, you on, always have, most, in most of the cases, you just have to apply the definition of the variable you're considering. So what is the definition of this variable? The definition of this variable is this. Now, do you recognize it? How much is this? Look at your notes. We define this. This is the i component of the distribution, of p. Yeah, time t. 
at time k, sorry. Okay, you see this? Now, what happens if I divide this by t? Okay, I have to divide everything. But I'm also dividing this. But now this has a meaning. It has a physical meaning. Look at the definition. What is an i of t? It is the number of times that I was visiting the ith state in the first t steps, or t plus 1, including 0. This number is a frequency. So it is the frequency of the time from 0, the frequency of the, how should I say, the, the fraction of time between 0 and t that I spent in the state, right? And this is the expectation of the fraction of time, because t is a constant. So you can take in and out of the, of the expectation as you want. So the meaning of this is exactly that this is the expected fraction of time that the random walk was in state i between the beginning and round t. So this is, has a beautiful um, physical interpretation because it is making sense of why page rank makes sense. So why does it make sense? Essentially, do you agree with me that intuitively the more time a random walk spends in a, in a page, the more important central that page is? You see, I am just visiting the graph at random. I mean, yeah, a modified version of the graph, but essentially related to the original graph. I'm visiting it at random. And I happen to spend more time in certain pages than others. I can arguably conclude that perhaps those pages are, are more central in the graph, because you end up in those pages more often, more frequently, right? So, <clears throat> this explains why taking a random walk, considering the stationary distribution, and then ranking vertices according to the value of the stationary distribution is a good way of ranking the nodes, okay? And in order to understand that, we have to use this result. Uh, is this always true? Well, it is true in the limit. I mean, this is always true, this is always true, but it is only in the limit that this quantity tends to the stationary distribution, okay? But how fast is this, going, is this one going to get close to this? Well, that depends on the eigenvalues of the matrix P, of the transition matrix. Okay, let's say that if the matrix mixes well, as we say, then uh, let's say in a logarithmic number of steps, it means in a logarithmic number of iterations of the power method, this limit and this are pretty close. Hmm? We'll say a bit more about that. But is this connection clear? So, this is extremely important because it is telling you that another way of estimating page rank, for example, could be just to really run, uh, or let's say centrality of, a, of, a, of pages, would just be to run a random walk for a number of steps and then to see how frequently <coughs> the random walk is in every node of the network, okay? <coughs> Maybe you can even run independent random walks in parallel so that you have more samples, and then you compute the frequency. And the frequency, this frequency is a good estimation of the stationary distribution. Actually, that's the second way to compute page rank. It's called Monte Carlo sampling. Okay? <clears throat> so, but uh, I actually wanted to show you this because it helps you understand why we are ranking pages, uh, we are, uh, web pages in this way, why it makes sense. So it has a very physical and intuitive interpretation, okay? So this result is, is one result I'm not going to prove, of course, I should prove it, but it is true. Hmm? You find in any algebra textbook. So at this point, we have all the ingredients we want because now we know that what we have to do. We take the original graph, so the web graph, I mean, we have, and the web graph is a bit nasty, dead ends, not strongly connected, periodic states, all possible mess you can figure out. And then we adjust it a little bit. Of course, we shouldn't uh, spoil the graph. It means we shouldn't <coughs> modify it in such a way that the original topolo topology is lost, because otherwise we lose all information. For example, you cannot make it just a complete network. All information is lost. 
So we have to preserve the original information. How are we going to do that? Well, first of all, I think there is a mistake here. <coughs> Actually, yes, there is a mistake. So, <coughs> removal of dead ends. <coughs> How do we remove dead ends? Um, this is assuming that you have a column representation. So every column represents the outgoing link of the graph. So I want to replace every column with zeros with a column of entries equal to one over the number of nodes. The right way to do this is the following. Can I cancel this? You, you go over these calculations yourselves. Huh? Okay, you try to follow all the passages yourselves. You should be able to do that. Maybe in two, three, in groups of two, three. So, let's say the original matrix was A. So, the dens, spider traps, all. First of all, let's remove the dens. How are we going to remove the dens? Sorry, the original matrix was M. That's my mistake. So this matrix would be a stochastic matrix, only some columns corresponding to dead ends are zeros. Huh? We want to remove those. How do we remove those? We have to re replace each of them with a, ve a column of one over ends, right? How can we do this? To me, this is a bit clearer. This is the, the, the column ones. Hmm? And where should I put the ones? Yeah, it is not the same formula. I know. Let's say this is a column of one over ends. Where should I put them? I should put them in every position in which you have a dead end. Every column corresponding to a dead end. How do I do that? That's the way I do this. Let's make an example. In this case, the vector A so this was a column of zeros, right? The vector A will be the following. N is equal to 3. Convince yourselves that this is the right thing to do. Yeah? When you take this product, this is a matrix, right? You should convince yourselves that this matrix is exactly Yeah? Then I multiply by this, 1 over n, and that's it. Uh, actually, 1 over 3 in our case. Okay? <clears throat> Remember, this is something that you don't see very often, but you can multiply two vectors and obtain a matrix. Yeah? Questions? Yes or no? Good. <clears throat> now, at this point, we have a matrix A, which is a stochastic matrix. Huh? Maybe, maybe, maybe it is not yet what we want, maybe we still have periodic states, but the matrix is now stochastic. So it represents a Markov chain, hmm? a special kind of a Markov chain, in which all the entries on the same column or row, depending on whether you use the transpose, are equal. Hmm? That's the only difference between, run actually, difference between random walks and Markov chains more in general. A random walk is typically a special case of a Markov chain. That's all. And actually, they are essentially equivalent if you generalize the notion of a random walk. Um, so once we have done this, from now on, I will always assume that the matrix you have, let's call it A or P, how you want to, is stochastic. So one problem doesn't exist anymore. Now the next problem. Oh. Periodicity. That's a pain. Periodicity is a pain because understanding 
when the chain is periodic, finding out the states which are periodic is not easy. So it can be very subtle. The web graph is huge. And you won't, don't want to find a, hay, uh, um, a needle in a haystack. OK? Too expensive. So you come up with a very brutal solution that is going to kill any possible uh, periodic state at the same time. Hmm. What is the solution? Teleporting, again. <clears throat> if you teleport, so add one link to any other page in the graph, you are killing periodicity. The problem is that you cannot just blindly apply teleporting everywhere because we have seen this already, you get a complete graph which is useless. So you want to preserve the topology of the original graph. How are you going to do that? That is where the two guys had a very smart idea. It is smart for several reasons, actually. And, uh, I don't, I'm not sure they soon realized why. But no, 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 I mean, that's their. So you know the algebra, there is an algebra behind all this that may not have been completely clear at the time. Hmm? I saw at least another journal of the ACM paper about these topics, this very topic. So it was not completely clear. Now we know exactly what is going to happen. Um, so the idea was the following. Let us try, let's always consider the random walk interpretation of page rank, okay? But now, let us try to modify the picture a little bit. So the original, the original idea was the following. <clears throat> this is the original formula, yeah? The flow formulation we have seen. So this corresponds to the following uh, interpretation. Whenever I'm here, hmm, I'm going to follow the links with probability inversely proportional to my out degree. So given that I am in this vertex at time i, uh, sorry, given that I'm in this vertex at any round, in the next round I will be in j with probability equal to 1 over di, right? And of course you have to sum over all the all the vertices that have one edge <coughs> incident in J, right? That is the meaning of this equation. Now, we are going to make a slightly, we are going to modify this random walk in the following way. So, when you are at this node, you do the following. So, B, beta is actually, no, it is normally called alpha, I have to say. I don't know why they call beta here, but. It is called, in, called normally alpha. I like alpha. It's, uh, it is called uh, teleporting probability or dumping factor. I do the following. First of all, I toss a coin with probability that gives me heads with probability beta. If I get heads, so with probability beta, I just follow the links. So I do this. Instead, Let's say that this probability is relatively large, 0 0.8, 0 0.85, 0 0.9. Hmm? With the residual probability, I jump uniformly at random, okay? So I have two possibilities here. Either I follow these links, hmm? and in this case, notice, Okay, the probability of following each of these links is 1 over the i, but I only, uh, sorry, 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 people. My mistake. But I only follow them with global probability beta. What do I do with probability 1 minus beta? I follow all the links, any link, including these ones again, but with probability 1 minus beta divided n, okay? So, 
If you look at the underlying graph that you obtain, it is again a complete graph. The difference now is that this is no longer a uniform uh, Markov chain. So some of the probabilities on the edges are different, are bigger than the other ones, okay? And I say they are bigger because n is definitely larger than any possible degree. Hmm. Okay, you see that? So this is by far the most, the smallest probability, transition probability you can have. And very often, in, typically, this is way, way smaller than this. Okay? So, what does it mean? I still have, <coughs> now Markov chain is again aperiodic and irreducible. Why? Because I essentially built a complete graph. Only the graph I built is weighted on the, on the edges, on the links, and the weights of, the, of links that were not existing before is very, very small. Okay? That's the idea. Is it clear? Yes or no? Hmm? And then you get this equation. So, um, just to understand, if I ask you, let's simulate the exam. I ask you, give me the page rank algorithm. Ah. If you know this equation, you know the page rank algorithm because it is just enough to read the probabilities. Hmm? Toss, a, toss a coin. If I get this event, I follow the links, as before. Else, if this happens, I just jump uniformly at random to all possible vertices, including myself and including neighbors that re really exist. Okay? So actually this the probability of following this link, for example, is this plus 1 minus beta divided by n. So you also have that contribution. Okay? And that's it. Now, as you can understand, the larger b, hmm, the closer this random walk is to the original one. You see that? So the idea is that if you keep beta large enough, but not 1, you are uh, you're achieving two goals. The first goal is that the chain is aperiodic and irreducible. So you will, you will have a stationary distribution, which you haven't in that case. The second one is still that you are still keeping the topology of the original graph into account. You see that? Because the weight you give to random jumps is very small. Also, why random jumps? You see, in this way, whenever you decide to jump, you are not favoring any vertex with respect to the others. You see what I mean? They are treat, you are treating them equally. That is also the reason why, whenever you jump, you can even jump on the same node you are at. You are at. So you give every node the same importance. And you are essentially done. What are we left to do? Uh, what we are left to do is actually the theory at this point is done. What we are left to do is just to play a little bit with this equation more so that we can show how we can efficiently apply the power method to this. Because there is an issue still to resolve. If I have a graph of 100 no nodes, I mean, I compute a stationary distribution or an approximation as you want. Huh? But when the graph has uh, 100 billion nodes, Eh, that is not as trivial. Okay, so I have to be careful. So I have to do some manipulations so that I do not get killed by memory, by even external memory. Or, hmm? So what can we do? I think at this point I am not really fond of the, of the slides. Let's see. Now, So, first of all, let us try to write this again. Uh, let's, let us write it in... Um, let us write this in um, matrix form, in vector form, okay? Let's say wh wh how the vector, how the vector computed at time t plus 1, t, or t, 
plus one or what you want. Depends on the vector computed at the end of the previous iteration. Okay? So I want to know the probability distribution at time t, uh, given the probability distribution time t minus one. What should I do? How do we call the transition matrix? It was A, right? A was the transition matrix modified by removing the dense. Hmm. Now we know this. Oh, actually, um, See that? Yeah? Okay. Hmm? Well, I mean, if I specialize this for the generic component, I obtain that. Okay? You should spend five minutes to see this. I mean, but it's easy. I mean, it's, a, it's a type of exercise. For now, if you want, you just believe me. Then, at the end of the lecture, you don't want to believe me anymore, and you will <laughs> take this, remember who A is. Actually, it's just a transition matrix of a strongly connected graph, let's say, or of a stochastic, it's a stochastic matrix, and then you convince yourselves that these and that are the same. This is just the same equation in matrix form. Okay, so are we happy with this? More or less. Uh, well, more or less, be why? Because, first of all, there is something missing here, right? For example, there is a beta missing. Now we are happy. Good. Now we are happy. That's the first reason. Um, can we say now... So, Professor Becchetti, you told us we want to apply the power method. The power method is something like this. That is what we want, <coughs> right? This is the power method, and this is a matrix, and if I know something about the spectrum of the matrix, so the eigenvalues, I can say whether or not this is going to converge and so on. But what is this? I mean, yeah, this looks more or less like a power method, but this, you're adding this every time. Why is it going to converge? Why would it converge? Are you sure it converges? Maybe it just converges to this, the same for everybody, useless. Hmm. So, if this were one, well, actually, this would be zero and I would be done. If this were, z were zero, this would be one, and yes, you would be right, that's a uniform matrix, and uh, we are getting to a uniform distribution. Um, but where is P here? So, where is P here? You see this? How do we reconcile this with this? Uh, actually, that's a, a stupid trick. Remember the following. How much is this? Ah, ah. You always know how much is this. It's one. It's a probability distribution, right? That is why we made the matrix A stochastic in the first place. It is a uniform, it is a probability distribution. So this is always one. Okay, now remember this.
That's, that's a stupid trick. Why? How much is this? One. Hmm? But sometimes you just rewrite things to, to get a deeper insight into a problem. So we don't substitute one here, otherwise it's useless. But what is important is that these and these are the same. Yeah? But now I can take this out. I can, I can take RT minus one out, which is what I wanted to. Yeah. This now is a legitimate matrix. And you should appreciate the fact that this is, this is a P is a stochastic matrix. How can it be otherwise? These and these are the same. They, it is just describing the, a random walk, a modified random walk. But it cannot be anything else than a stochastic matrix. So P is a stochastic matrix. And we have the very form that we want to have. So actually, this is the power method in this guy's form. OK? So we know that this matrix, this is the power method. We also know by other ways that this will always converge, because it, it corresponds to an ergodic Markov chain. Hmm? The only thing we don't know, actually, yet, is how fast it converges. Uh, I mean, the stationary distribution is an ideal object which is going to be there. You are never going to compute a stationary distribution. That is only achieved in the infinite, in an infinite time, and you would need infinite precision to compute it. What you normally do is that you stop, you apply the power method for a given number of steps, and then you check how this vector and this vector are different. When they are close enough, you say, OK, it's almost converging. And then you stop. OK? The question is, how long does it take before the, the norm of the difference between this vector and this one is small enough? Where small enough is something that you decide. The number of steps it takes, it turns out, depends on the second eigenvalue of p. But how much is the second eigenvalue of p? We are not going to, I'm not going to give the details, not today at least. It turns out that the second eigenvalue of P actually depends on beta. The smaller beta, the higher, uh, the smaller the second eigenvalue. The smaller the second eigenvalue, the faster this converges. So what you obtain is the following. If you want to have fast convergence, you should pick beta small. But if you pick beta small, you're losing the topology of the original graph. That is something that happens most of the times, right? We always have conflicting objectives. If you want something from somewhere, you need to give something else. In nature, it's like that. I mean, you, you don't escape that. There is always a price to pay. Very often, there is no free lunch. Huh? So, Breen and Page, also running experiments, found that a good compromise between retaining the original topology of the graph and achieving convergence in, say, 50, 80 iterations, which is not much. A few tens of iterations. Was to pick beta between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. Okay? The reason for that, if we do a little bit of math, actually is clear. It has to do with the logarithm of something. Okay? It's a log of n uh, multiplied by something else. If I have time, I'll show you. It's not really that hard. So, now that we have this, good. We can really come up. We have our page rank. So this is the definition of page rank as a random walk. This. This, algorithm. this is an algorithm. This is the, the defi defines the page rank algorithm in the generic iteration. And by applying the power method, so computing this over time, this will converge to the stationary distribution. Fine. 
So it seems that um, there, is another, there is another reason to have this representation, is that actually now the page rank at any given step is defined as a vector matrix multiplication or matrix vector multiplication, depends on. Okay, why is this important? Uh, it is very important because I can give two definitions of this. One is this one, it's this definition. The other one, they are equivalent, right? So this corresponds to this. Which one do you think they're using to compute page rank in practice? It is the same. Mathematically, it's the same. It's just another way of writing things. But which one do you think is used in practice? The first one? Let's see. Let's say that uh, we have n states, right? So P, in general, belongs to this. Right? If you want to compute P square, you have to take the product of two matrices of size n times n. The best known algorithm for computing the product of two matrices is n to the two point something. Now, n is, say, 40 billions. Do you think I'm going to take the product of two matrices? No, no way. Add to the 10 to the 20, I don't even want to think about. Okay, now, if you have a vector matrix multiplication, it may, I mean, it may be a bit better because you have a matrix. Of course, you have the problem of storing this matrix and maybe main memory is, is not feasible. But first of all, this is normally I mean, it's not a sparse matrix. Notice that now this is not a sparse matrix because actually every entry is non-zero. But all the entries that, are, that were zero originally and are non-zero now, they all have this value, right? So actually, this is a sparse matrix because if the original graph is sparse, if the original matrix is sparse, and normally for the web graph it is sparse, you just have to remember that at some point you have to sum this contribution, okay? So the underlying matrix A is sparse. So it's just a matter of storing of how you deal with it. <clears throat> but on the other hand, if I want to multiply a vector by a matrix, I can do this. I mean, n times n times n. I mean, it's uh, still n square in principle, but the matrix is sparse, so it's actually much less and so on, okay? Instead, if you want to take the power, there is no way in which you can apply this trick so I've remembered that some of the entries are all the same because the first time you do the multiplication, everything is crumbled. You cannot apply this trick anymore. That's another reason not to do matrix multiplication, okay? So, um, this is just reminding you that taking beta equal to 0 0.8, for example, means the following, that in the average, you are following the links for roughly a few steps, four or five times, and then you're jumping, okay? It's a geometric distribution. You should, um, for example, estimate, take the, the expected number of steps that you do before a jump. It's a geometric distribution, you can do that. Hmm? To know how, may, how long it takes before I jump doesn't need you to know the topology of the graph, right? Whatever the topology, you will choose to jump independently of it, okay? So, and then this is what happens in practice. Hmm. Then it's, uh, eventually it starts to, starts to stabilize over vectors which are not very easy computable for, from the original graph. Hmm. Very often the stationary distribution of Markov chains are not trivial to compute. I mean, there is in general no closed formula to compute, to have the stationary distribution of a Markov chain from the topology of the under underlying graph, okay? Uh, it's an eigenvector computation, and eigenvectors don't like to be easily computed. There is one way in which this is possible. Uh, I'll tell you another time, you remind me, okay? So, 
So let me see what time it is. And if this is, no, we still have time. Well, 15 minutes, I can, can do a lot of things. I can finish this part. So how do we actually compute the page rank? Well, first of all, it seems that we are going, uh, so in the slides they called P, so they call A what I've called P here, okay? So, essentially, if we think about what we need to keep in memory hmm, to perform the computation, actually it is just two vectors. At any point in time, we need to remember the old vector because we needed to compute a new one, and then we need to store uh, the new one, right? So at any point in time, we have two vectors with n entries each. Now, assume that uh, we have, I don't know, 20 billion pages for each page. Uh, so we have two vectors of 20 billion entries each, which has 40 billions. And uh, for each of them, uh, I don't know, 32 bits for each entry. Uh, yeah, 40, 160, 160 gigabytes. Okay, now, we, this is a bit at the limit. Maybe you can keep it in main memory. Sometimes you can't. But uh, I mean, there is also a way to handle the cases in which you cannot uh, even keep the page rank in main memory. Hmm? But I'll be happy with just uh, handling the case in which you can keep it in main memory, but you cannot keep the matrix in main memory, which that's very often the case, okay? So, uh, let's go back to two billion entries. In that case, the matrix, in principle, this matrix has a huge number of entries, huge, okay? Even disk is too much. For, even for disk, that's too much. That's uh, terabytes. Hmm? We don't want to have terabytes of secondary storage just to store the matrix. Then we have to remember this trick. So the matrix P actually consists of the following, a first part, which is a scaled down, mat a scaled down version of matrix A, in which every entry of A is multiplied by beta, and the second part, which is actually a flat matrix. To store a flat matrix, I just need to store the value. Oh, it's a uniform matrix, right? So it's actually one entry I have to remember. That's not much. Hmm? So actually, I'm only going to store A. The difference is that A normally is a sparse matrix. The number of entry, non-zero entries in A is equal to what? Come on. Quickly thinking. The number of entries in A is equal to what? Hmm? Of the edges, right? Good. There is an issue with the dead ends, because for every dead end I added n edges, but I, in that case I just need to remember which are the dead ends. I do not need uh, to explicitly store them in this matrix. You see my point? If you think of the original matrix of the graph, it is the number of non-zero entries is, uh, is exactly equal to the number of, of links. I mean, the number of links of a two billion graph is large, but we know that the web graph as, let's say, distribution of the out degree and the in degree, which is roughly a power law. I mean, some bit, something between a, a, logarit a, a logarithmic distribution and a mild power, and the mild power law. So it is something that can maybe I have 20 billion entries. Okay, it's something that you can store in main memory. Ah, we know this. What are they doing here? Okay. If you have n nodes and in the average you have 10 entries per node, which corresponds to a few vertices having very high degrees and most of the vertices, so the heavy tail, having very few degrees, very, very uh, small degrees. Let's say 10 n entries. So you have 2 billion you have 2 billion vertices, maybe you have 10, 20 billion links. We can store this on disk, okay? Maybe 100 megabytes with ancillary information. And this is the algorithm. 
Hmm. Now, look at the trick you have to do. Because as we said, you don't want to make this, even this vector matrix multiplication explicitly. You don't want to do that. Hmm? So actually, you will just perform this vector matrix multiplication. So you actually are going to write this in the original way, in this way. Hmm? Once we have shown that this is actually equivalent to a power method applied to this matrix, now we can go back to this formulation because it, is, because it is more convenient to use. Because this is telling us that in order to perform one iteration of the power method, I do not need to do this vector matrix multiplication. I can just multiply the ve vector computed in the previous iteration by A, scale everything down by beta, and then for every node, I just have to remember to leak this, this contribution to the page rank back to the vertices. Uh, look at another uh, way to look at this. It is as if I, uh, I had been doing the following. From the previous uh, page rank vector computed at time t minus 1, I'm remo removing a fraction beta of it. Uh, sorry, I'm retaining a fraction beta. And I'm using that to do the uh, calculation. And essentially, this fraction, the fraction 1 minus beta that I'm removing from here, I'm giving back again spread uniformly. Hmm? So this is page rank leaking. To leak means to, to lose water. Hmm? I'm leaking page rank here, and I'm reintroducing page rank back in the second step. OK, notice the, uh, what is the difference with respect to this case. The difference is that here I have to do a vector matrix multiplication. There is no way out of it. But the, this matrix is sparse. Here, instead, I just have to update one vector. So th this operation has a cost of n, right? I just have to update the component of a vector. That's the difference. This one would be a pain. This would have a cost of n times matrix of dimension n times n, which is dense. This is sparse. OK? Even if they have a way cumbersome way of writing this, what I was just telling you and these are the same. Actually, if you look at what S is, this is exactly 1, mi one minus beta. OK? Just because. The sum of this, r prime, is equal to b to beta. This is exactly equal to beta. Hmm? OK, so the sum of these vectors is beta. You agree with this? OK. So why is the algorithm stated in this form? Uh, the reason is that it wants to reflect what we are actually doing when you implement it. So you have a vector that is not a true page rank vector. It's a beta scale version of the page rank in the next step. And, uh, and then you are going to update it by summing this, compo this contribution, which is the same for everybody. And since beta, the sum of the r prime j has to sum to beta, this is just 1 minus beta divided by n. OK, so what is the stopping criterion, as I was telling you? This is, for example, the one norm of the difference of the two vectors. So as the vectors get closer and closer, this difference will tend to zero. OK? You go on as long as this difference is some epsilon that you decide. What do you think? Is epsilon larger or smaller than 1? Epsilon is larger or smaller than 1? Hmm? These vectors always sum to 1. So epsilon can be something small. Actually, it could be 10 to the minus something, OK? Once you've done this, that's your page rank. Um, this is the algorithm in which you have, you're keeping the vectors, both vectors, uh, let's say, are old and are new in main memory. And you're keeping the, the matrix in secondary storage. Hmm? OK, and this is how you would actually do it. 
for the generic vertex, you update the component of each entry of the vector one at a time. So in this example, vertex J has a uh, uh, Yes. So, you maintain a vector in practice. Hmm? Whenever you scan, whenever you scan a row, you are scanning the out links of one entry. Okay. For example, the vertex with source uh, with source zero has destinations one, five, and six, which are not shown in the picture. So, for every destination, you update the page rank of that destination of a contribution equal to the old value of page rank for the, the vertex you are considering, for example, zero, divided by n. In this case, n in the picture is not the number of vertices, it's the out degree of vertex p, okay? Notice that in this way, you may update the same row several times, each for every vertex that has, the, uh, that, uh, that has this destination hmm? through an outgoing link. Okay, so it's the other way. You don't update one entry at a time, actually, for every entry that you scan, you update all the destinations of, the, of that vertex, all the neighbors. Okay, we'll see this in the second, review this in the second part of the lecture. Uh, because I think, oh, <laughs> you thought. So the out degree is three, okay? Whenever I'm scanning the first row, hmm, I, will do, I will do the following. So R new is initialized to zero, essentially, in every, run, in every new step. Hmm? R new is set to the zero vector. So in every iteration, R new is initialized to zero. Okay? and so on. Okay, now assume that there is another vector with out degree, without degree two, pointing to one. At some point, I will have, again, Is this clear now? Okay, so this way of proceeding is dual. Huh? Uh, no, sorry, one. One, one. Sorry. So, just to be clear, this equation is 
is different. In this equation, I essentially I'm updating the, the, the page rank of one vertex all at a time, but in practice, when I'm computing this really, since the, uh, I am representing on secondary storage the adjacency list. Hmm? So in order to apply this formula, in this, uh, in this line I should have the incoming links. Right? Instead I have the outgoing edges. So it is the same. It only means that I am updating this vertex whenever it appears as the destination of a neighbor of another vertex. That's all. Okay? So I'm not, uh, I'm not updating it in one shot. I am updating it over time. But that's the same. It's the same equation. Okay? Now we can stop. <laughs>